Is my screen visible? Yes, it's visible. If you can kindly make it full view. Yeah, thank you. Now it is fine. Now it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. Yes. So um there's a problem, I guess. Okay. Yeah, uh, so I'll then uh, directly jump to the direct tax uh direct tax provisions um, which have been proposed by the finance minister. Uh, if we look at the, 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 the provisions that have been uh, 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 that have been discussed yesterday uh, uh, day before yesterday, uh, there are roughly about uh, 120 uh, provisions that have been uh, proposed under direct taxes alone, under income taxes alone. And uh, so for the, for the uh, ease of discussion, a couple of uh, matters relating to uh, cooperative societies and trusts have been excluded from this presentation so that uh, we only discuss what is probably relevant uh, uh, for, for, our, for, our, uh, for, for the day. Now let's look at uh, what, what are the provisions that have been proposed for uh, individuals. Okay, sorry. And now, if if you remember, the new tax regime has been introduced in, in the budget uh, of 2020, and the new tax regime has not been so successful. Uh, there were not many, many takers for the new tax regime, and uh, uh, because the new tax regime says that you cannot take any deductions, you cannot claim any. Uh, interest on uh, house property, uh, loan on house property, and you cannot take uh, uh, any ATC deductions. And uh, it is it is simply without these deductions that you compute the taxes. And uh, the new tax regime has been introduced in 2020. However, uh, it was not really favored by uh, most of the individuals. And uh, it is... Uh, essentially uh, a dampener. Now to push uh, the new tax regime, couple of, uh, couple of amendments have been proposed and uh, the number of slabs under which uh, the new tax regime has been, uh, ha has been uh, taxed earlier, that has been reduced from seven to six. So if you look at, uh, these are the new, let me, Okay, now uh, these are the, okay, uh, these, you, on the left side, you can see the number of uh, uh, proposed slabs, which have been uh, broadly reduced. And uh, earlier it were, it were about uh, seven slabs. Now let's look at what is the new regime, how the new regime works for the individual taxes uh, versus uh, the old regime. Under the old regime, you're uh, allowed to take deductions. Under the new regime, you cannot take any deductions. And if you make a comparison about how the tax would imply would, uh, would be uh, calculated under both these options, you can see that uh, for a 25 lakh uh, uh, gross total income, we have assumed about four lakhs as a deductions. Uh, and uh, the total tax between the tax arbitrage uh, between uh, old tax and the new tax would be roughly about uh, 8,000 rupees or maybe just under 8,000 rupees. But if you look at, uh, so if, if you look at uh, an income of say 5 crore 50 lakhs, uh, you can see that there is a tax arbitrage and uh, a more favorable tax uh, payment under the new tax regime. And let us understand why. Now, Few of the provisions that have uh, been uh, proposed for this uh, new tax regime is that the surcharge has been reduced from 37% to 25%, where the total income is exceeding 5 crores. 
now effectively this is this is under the new tax regime only and because of this provision you can see that the effective tax rate comes down by roughly about 3% so this is one uh, differentiating factor that would be coming in also the rebate limit has been introduced has been enhanced from 5 lakhs to 7 lakhs under the new tax regime so there is no tax paid if the income is up to 7 lakh rupees and earlier there was no standard deduction under the new tax regime which is now proposed to be introduced to say that up to 50000 rupees the standard deduction is allowed uh if you if you look at if you look at the way uh, the government is trying to look at uh, the new tax regime is that there is lot of push for uh, the new tax uh, regime there is uh, uh, an attempt to reduce or streamline the number of deductions uh, and give certainty to whatever it, that you can claim under the old tax regime so there is more of uh, 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 if you look at the the tax arbitrage between these two regimes it is it is uh, narrowing as much as possible but if critically it will depend on the amount of deductions that one can claim so if the deductions is less than 4 lakhs obviously one has to look at the facts of the case uh, and compute in in each in their own uh, situation and see what could be the deduction what could be the tax payment if the deductions are different if it is not 4 lakhs or if it is say 2 lakhs only so the numbers the the uh, decision could vary between the old tax regime and the new tax regime so this is one very critical point that one needs to keep in mind also one other provision that has been uh, uh, introduced is the income from insurance policies now what earlier we have seen that under section 10 10d you have ex, you have income which is from uh, insurance policies if you pay insurance policies and there is an uh, income that has been received either it could be a money back or it could be something else now such income is exempted under 10 10d going forward if there are any premiums which are paid in excess of 5 lakh rupees per annum and the 5 lakhs could be spread out it could be one policy it could be multiple policies but if the if the premium is more than 5 lakh rupees such insurance policies we the income from such insurance policies will be taxed sub and uh, the taxation regulations will be more or less the, like uh, ulip which was introduced about a year ago so uh, there is there will be a, a probably a circular or a notification which will come on the method of calculation but we presume it will be similar to how it was done under circular 2 of 2022 so uh, so this is one uh, other provision that has uh, been uh, introduced now if you look at the way uh, early so long the old tax regime has been the default uh, met, default option when you are filing a return that's the default option and then the new tax regime is what you actually opt for it you are you are opting for a new tax regime now this is going to change and the new tax regime will be the default option and if one has to opt for the old tax that has to be specifically opted for there are few question do i do you want me to take up now or you can i should take up up later sir we can take later in q and a session okay okay so this is uh, now coming to the co corporate taxes the taxes that are applicable to business taxes uh, businesses uh, there are no changes in uh, corporate taxes at all it remains the same so more or less the certainty has been uh, assured not tinkering with uh, uh, with uh, uh, the rates of taxes like the way they have done for the the individual taxation but uh, coming to uh, units under uh, scz uh, which are claiming deduction under 10 aa uh, earlier there was a not so clarity about receipt of uh, foreign exchange the forex income within a specified period 
Now that has been introduced to say that the forex which has has to be received within six months from the end of the financial year. Also, it is mandatory that the return has to be filed within the due date to claim deduction under 10 AA. So now, uh, of course, 10 AA has uh, has has been uh, there's a sunset clause which was uh, earlier two years ago, but then. Uh, you, uh, the entities, units claiming 10 AA deduction will have to claim it if uh, they can only claim it if they can file the return within the due date and the deduction will also be extended only if the forex or the foreign exchange is received within six months or any extended time which the RBA specifies a to a particular concern. This is, uh, again, uh, uh, this is relating to uh, units in SEZ. Now, also other provision that has been introduced is towards expenses paid to MSME. So whenever expenses are paid to MSME, uh, going forward, the expenses will be only allowed it on actual payment basis. But if there are any payments which are accounted on accrual basis, now according to the MSME Act, if the, there is a specified agreement with the MSME, it has to be received within 45 days, or if there is no such agreement, the amount has to be received within 15 days. So if you are accounting on the basis of approval, the money should come within 45 or 15 days as the case may be. But otherwise, by uh, under section 43B, the expenses amounts paid to MSME will be only allowed on actual payment basis. Again, uh, coming to the presumptive taxation uh, in terms of professions and businesses, uh, the earlier limits were up to two crores uh, in the case of business and 50 lakhs in the case of professionals. Uh, the limit has now been extended to three crores and 75 lakhs respectively. Uh, the, uh, there is an li interest limitation under 94B when there is a loan taken from a related party or an associated enterprise overseas. And uh, there are also deeming provisions where the loans are taken from a, uh, an unrelated party, but the loans are guaranteed by a, a related party. In such cases, uh, there is an exemption provided earlier to banks where a bank is giving a loan uh, to the Indian entity, such loans are exempted. So now that extension, that uh, benefit has been extended to certain specified NBFCs also. Uh, also, there is a clarification that was brought in about uh, the cost of acquisition in the case of intangibles. Now, uh, there were a lot of litigation earlier in the past about uh, the cost of acquisition in the case of intangibles. Now that has been very clearly mentioned to say that the cost of acquisition in the case of intangibles will be nil. Uh, so that has been uh, uh, clearly mentioned in the in this section. Okay, sorry. Now, in the case of a joint development agreement uh, where uh, individuals or HUF have a specific uh, provision of taxation, now that has been clarified to say that there was, there was a confusion about the words uh, cash. So when, if you look at section 45, subsection 5A, it says the consideration is the, the fair market value plus the net cash, Plus the cash received. Now, uh, so the there were there were interpretations which were taken in the past to say that cash is actually cash received and not payments uh, through through bank or other, uh, in other modes. Now that has been extended to say that the consideration will be also including checks and electronic payments. So that's how we compute the total amount of consideration in the case of a joint development agreement. Also, uh, there is a there is always a mismatch when a deductor deducts TDS and it is already accounted as an income by the uh, by the deductee. So a deductee offers the income is let's say in year one 
whereas the deductor for various reasons it could happen that uh, he actually makes the tds payment to the government in year 2 and he claims an expenditure in year 2 based on the tds deducted now what happens in such a situation is there is always a mismatch between the deductor claiming uh, tds and the deductee actually uh, uh, actually sorry the deductee claiming the uh, tds and the deductor actually making the payment to the government now that has that anomaly has been addressed to say that if the deductee has claimed has offered the income he can apply within 2 years to the tax officer to say that such credit has to be given to him and the credit accordingly will be uh, will be adjusted and there is no mismatch so the mismatch has been addressed uh, appropriately and this is this is a very welcome move because it reduces lots of litigation in uh, where this uh, mismatch of tds credits are uh, are abundant again uh, where uh, in the in the case of uh, uh, preliminary expenses uh, which uh, the deduction is claimed under section 35d uh, what actually uh, is the process is in term, in terms of certain preliminary expenditure the process is that one has to apply to the cbdt or the board and an approval needs to be obtained and accordingly that expenditure can be incurred and this leads to lot of a uh, lot of time lag between the board giving approval and the actual uh, requirement of the uh, expenses so that has been dispensed with now to say that there is a statement that the tax of the uh, tax payer will apply to the uh, will will file and based on the statement the uh, assessing officer will take a, a view now that the board uh, and our cbdt has been done away with the approval of the board or cbdt has been done away with now so if you look at if you look at the corporate taxes or business taxes which, which are applicable there are more of a uh, procedural uh, clarifications procedural uh, issues but not not a very uh, very impactful kind of uh, provisions it's more of uh, clarificatory in nature also uh, one provision that uh, which has been introduced on uh, relating to capital gains is relating to market linked uh, debentures now what is meant by market linked debenture is it's a listed debenture which is uh, it could be listed on an nsc or a bsc and where the underlying asset underlying principal is actually a debt but the return on that debt is uh, is related is linked to the market so it it looks like a quasi kind of an equity or a debt so uh, so far uh, ssc's have been treating that particular instrument as an as an equity and taking the long term capital gains uh, and then taxing it at 10% accordingly now that has been done away with to say that a new section has been introduced 50 double a it says that the taxes will be treated it will be any market linked uh, debenture will be treated as a debt only and the capital gains will be treated as short term capital gains at tax at 30% now uh, coming to uh, assessments and uh, litigation now uh, the assessment in, uh, proceedings uh, closure of the assessment proceedings and completion of uh, assessment proceedings by the ao earlier uh, was uh, 12 months but has been reduced to 9 months uh, in the last budget and that has been now reinstated back to the 12 months so uh, it will be again up to march uh, to complete the assessments even for the updated returns the time closure uh, the time uh, uh, limit uh, it will be again 12 months from the end of the financial year in which the return has been updated return has been filed coming to uh, pendency of litigation at at uh, at cat appeals level there are lot of lot of um, cases which are pending for for disposal either part heard or not heard and uh, uh, they, th this is really leading to lot of uh, pending pending assessments now to address this there is an additional layer which has been uh, which is proposed to be introduced uh, which is joint commissioner or additional commissioner appeals who will be able to handle this excess or pending cases and give at least a speedy disposal of the cases on hand 
coming to uh, the uh, transfer pricing again uh, which is which is very relevant is that you know whenever there is a transfer pricing uh, in in the case of a transfer pricing uh, the ao issues notice for assessment and he gives 30 days notice to uh, submit the tp documentation now that 30 days has been reduced to 10 days again with the with an option that the SAO has the option to extend it for another 30 days. But essentially now the TP documentation will have to be kept ready. And uh, whenever uh, the assessment is, uh, assessing officer is asking this, it has to be submitted within 10 days. So uh, this is another relevant uh, thing that needs to be kept in mind where the documentation, everything has to be readily available. Uh, coming to uh, the penalties, uh, there are two major things that have been uh, proposed, which is uh, in the case of uh, the specified financial transactions, where there are inaccurate particulars which are which are submitted by the taxpayer, uh, there is a default, and the default the penalty would be roughly about fifty five thousand rupees per default, and there is also an enabling provision to recover such an amount from the default. Uh, taxpayer. Also, there are penalties and prosecutions which have been introduced for any violation uh, 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 under 194R, which is which was there last year, which came last year, which is tedious on perquisite, and also 194S, which is on a virtual digital asset. So, any any default in uh, remitting this uh, uh, 194R TDS or the TDS on virtual digital assets there are penalties and prosecutions which have been introduced. Uh, now coming to uh, the withholding taxes, uh, the TCS withholding taxes is TDS or TCS. Uh, coming to TCS on tours and packages, that the TCS has been uh, uh, extended from 5% to 20%. So uh, this is going to impact, uh, definitely is going to impact the tourism industry. And uh, also TDS has been increased from 5% to 20% in the case of liberalized any remittance under LRS scheme, the liberalized remittance scheme. So uh, obviously the cost of, uh, uh, you know, this one can take this as a refund, but, but definitely this is going to increase the cost of operations. Again, uh, in the case where uh, in a, a, Tax any any person is not required to file return in India. He will he is not subjected to uh, he, he is not subjected to TDS or TCS, and he need not uh, when he is not re required to file any return in India. He, not, he he need not be deducted uh, TDS against uh, the payment. Uh, okay, uh, coming to uh, the listed uh, entity listed debentures under one ninety three. Any interest paid to uh, a resident on listed debentures is actually exempted so far. Now that has been done away with and then withholding tax has been introduced on interest on listed debentures. Coming to uh, the non-resident taxation, uh, there were instances in the past where uh, the resident but not ordinary residents were given gifts and this escaped taxation I, uh, in India. Now that has been introduced to say that any gift by, uh, any gift received by uh, a person who is any resident who is uh, resident but not ordinarily resident uh, will be subjected to uh, tax uh, which is in excess of 50,000 rupees. Uh, I'll be not covering this 44 BB and 44 BBB which is more into exploration and uh, uh, civil construction where they, they have a presumptive taxation, they have a presumptive uh, base of taxation. And it was uh, observed that where they were following presumptive taxation, they were uh, paying lesser tax. And where their uh, incomes were lesser than the presumptive taxation rates, they were, for, for, they were getting the tax audit done and they were claiming the carry forward losses. So uh, essentially that has been flagged to say that they cannot claim this, uh, unabsorbed depreciation and loss in such cases. Again, uh, which is which is now this is very important uh, uh, provision where the consideration which is received by a private company 
from non residents so this is where uh, you know rashida was also mentioning about angel tax now this has also been uh, now co covered and as uh, under uh, 5627b to say that this has to be the amount has to be received at fair market value now it it has to be uh, it it cannot be more than the fair market value and under fema regulations it has to be it cannot be less than fair market value so if you look at both fema regulations and uh, tax regulations post this uh, amendment it has to be exactly at the fair market value and this is going to lead to a lot of litigation surely uh, and and uh, i think this is one one provision this which need, may need to be relooked at coming to uh, startups this the uh, sunset clause has now been extended from uh, 2023 to 2024 so any in, uh, incorporation can happen uh, under uh, as a startup and the date has been extended to 31st march 2024 also there is a relaxation uh, of 51% uh, shareholding pattern whenever there is a change in the shareholding pattern under section 79 the carry forward of losses earlier was only restricted up to 7 years now that has been extended to 10 years now coming to real estate uh, this this is uh, uh, the the first uh, amendment has been proposed to say that where there is an interest which is claimed as a deduction under either 24 or any any Uh, any uh, principal payment under uh, under six uh, year. Now, the interest payment again cannot be taken as cost of acquisition and claim uh, deduction when you are computing capital gains. So the double double impact cannot be taken. So if it is if it is not considered uh, only under section twenty four, it can be considered as part of cost of acquisition. L uh, let me take an example under twenty four. Uh, in the case of a self acquired property uh, the the interest is allowed up to 2 lakh rupees now let us say we have we have an interest of say 3 lakh rupees now 2 lakhs is what is claimed under section 24 and the excess of 1 lakh rupees only can be considered as cost of acquisition subsequently it's not that three, all the 3 lakhs can be considered as cost of acquisition this is a this is an important uh, amendment also uh, where there are uh, there are assets real estate or housing property which was which which costed more than say uh, 20 crores 30 crores property has been purchased there were instances where their deductions were considered under 54 or 54f 54 is on gross basis 54f is on uh, net basis now the limit has been introduced to say that uh, such a property uh, buying of a new property is restricted to 10 crores only so only up to 10 crores this will be coming under 54 or 54f as the case may be uh, the last uh, uh, slide on my presentation is about uh, an online ga gambling uh, on online gaming and online gaming is now carved out and a separate section has been introduced to say that the online income from online gaming will be taxed and there are also with withholding taxes provisions which have been introduced uh, to say that the uh, tds will be at the rate of 30% and uh, the tax also on uh, online gaming would be at at 30% so if you look at uh, it's more of streamlining the provisions uh, across and it's not that new new taxes have been introduced but at the same time uh, more of uh, more of streamlining and uh, settling the provisions is what has been aimed at okay so uh, that brings uh, me to the end of uh, my presentation and uh, we'll take the q and a later i'll ask uh, rajita to uh, address the indirect taxes
Yeah, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, Pradeep has just concluded on the direct tax portion, and uh, we move on to the indirect tax portion. Hope I'm audible and my screen is visible. Yes, perfect. Yes, screen is visible and audio is absolutely fine. Thank you. Are you audible? Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope I'm audible now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So uh, we move on to the indirect tax proposals. Um, so uh, basically, if we summarize indirect tax proposals from GST and customs perspective, there are not many changes uh, from GST, but from customs, there are some tariff changes and uh, some alignments. And overall, even if you compare the indirect taxes from a, uh, what, what kind of expectations we had, maybe uh, considering that we thought that it, it's going to be a populist budget etc but uh, those kind of expectations have not been met in the budget but overall it has been good uh, the changes primarily from a gst perspective are from the input tax credit uh, place of supply some penalty and compounding provisions some registration related provisions and uh, order uh, related changes and as far as customs is concerned it is primarily in relation to exemptions and settlement commission and some tariff and duty rate changes. So we first uh, covered the section on GST. On GST, on the first uh, point is input tax credit. Uh, major uh, point that is being debated right now is the CSR expenses. If we see uh, from when GST has been introduced, there was a lot of debate on whether expenses incurred on account of CSR and you pay GST on such expenses, whether that will be eligible for credit or not. Uh, and uh, there have been some advanced rulings on this front which are favorable and which are not favorable. But pre-GST, again, uh, the judicial precedence has shown that uh, credit is eligible on such expenses. Uh, however, this was not expected in this budget that uh, this is now disallowed as credit. So this cannot be, uh, you know, this can impact companies who are currently claiming credit. And in some cases, it can be big enough, especially listed companies with large turnover and net profits. Uh, the second change is in relation to the bond sales. Uh, we call it, when I'm saying bond sales, it is primarily from one bonded warehouse to another bonded warehouse. For example, from one EOU to an SEZ or one EOU to another EOU or from mover uh, manufacturing operations, bonded warehouse to another EOU. Those kind of transactions are called bond sales. And these are classified as exempt sale now and the input tax credit uh, provisions. And therefore, you will have to reverse the credit in relation to such bond sales. Uh, if it is a specific credit, specific credit has to be totally reversed. And if there's any common credit, that common credit to the extent of this exempt turnover would be required to be reversed. Uh, so this also is going to have a negative impact on your tax credits. The third uh, uh, provision is primarily a reporting related change. Uh, so uh, currently, there is a provision in the GST law which states that if you're not paying, making payments to vendors within 180 days, you will have to reverse the ITC. Uh, earlier, before this provision was introduced, the manner of reversing this ITC was slightly uh, tricky because you, the provision said that you will have to add this to the output tax liability in your return. And uh, because of which there could have been mismatches between what your turnover is in the books of accounts versus what is there in 3P. This reporting format has been changed uh, recently. 
but how the provisions uh, still remain the same and therefore this change has been brought into align to the reporting change format the next point is in relation to place of supply of services this is specific to uh, transportation services where the supplier and recipient both are in india but however goods are moving outside india and the destiny of the goods or destination of the goods is outside india in which case uh, the place of supply was mentioned as in case of such transactions the place of supply is where the goods are destined to go and therefore it will be outside india in such a case questions have been raised in certain cases whether you are eligible for credit because the place of supply is outside india uh, while technically uh, your portal allowed you to take and uh, there was nothing specific in the law which said that you are not entitled to take credit but since the input tax credit provisions specifically had certain conditions which said that you have to receive the goods or you have to receive the services to avail credit in this case the goods are moving outside india so therefore questions have been raised uh, in various corners on whether you will be entitled to credit on this or not and therefore this this amendment has been brought in wherein this clause has been removed and therefore now the place of supply in such cases is where the recipient is located and therefore the place of supply becomes in india and uh, clearly there will not be any litigation on this front or any debate on this front there are certain changes uh, from penalties and offenses perspective again this is a this is more industry friendly uh, launch prosecution that limit has been increased from 1 crore to 2 crores except in cases of false invoicing uh, certain offenses have been decriminalized uh, like any deliberate tampering of material evidence supplying non supply non supplying of information to the officers or not allowing any officers to come and discharge their duties also on compounding uh, so they have specifically said that there will not be compounding allowed in case of fake invoices or false uh, invoices and uh, also the list of offenses which can be compounded they have added two more categories one is where you're dealing in goods and you know that those goods are liable to confiscation second is you're dealing in some services which you know that they are contrary to the provisions of the gst law so these cases also have been added to the compounding list and therefore you can pay the amount uh, uh, which is provided for compounding and uh, get done with that compounding amount earlier the limit was ranging from 50% to 150 so minimum was 50% and maximum was 150% and now this range is revised uh, to 25% to 100% therefore the compounding amount has been decreased uh, there is a schedule 3 under the gst law which provides a list of certain transactions which are uh, non supply they're not treated as supply under the gst law and uh, they, when the gst law was introduced these transactions that is merchant trade transactions uh, which i mean to say are the transactions which are totally outside india while well, the recipient or or supplier may be in india but the goods do not move or come into india the transaction of supply takes place outside india and physical movement of goods also takes place outside india these are called merchant trade transactions bond sale which i just explain in my previous slides and high sea sales these three transactions were uh, again debated on whether this is treated as supply non supply taxes to be paid not paid or tax itc reversal has to be done or not so uh, in 2019 the government has brought in a change to include all these three in schedule 3 saying that these are non taxable and because they're not to, they're not going to be treated as supply but however now it has been clarified that from this amendment will be effective from july 2017 onwards as a result uh, there is there are two outcomes one outcome people who are already litigating this now there is clarity and therefore these cases will be dropped and people who have paid the second category is where you know there could be companies who have paid taxes on such transactions uh, uh, to that extent uh, the government has clarified that you cannot claim refund for that past period although this amendment is effective from july 2017 onwards uh, another major change is sharing of information while we all know currently uh, formally or informally uh, departments various departments are sharing information with each other like direct tax indirect tax uh, dgft etc now there is a specific change in the law which says that with the consent of the supplier uh, any information can be shared by the gst authorities and this information could be relating to invoicing in relation to purchases in relation to any information that we submit through various uh, portals that we use 
that can be shared with various other authorities. Some specific changes in relation to e-commerce operators. Uh, uh, before this amendment, any person who is supplying goods and wants to offer composition was not allowed to deal on an e-commerce uh, platform. Now this change will help all those taxpayers or, or those suppliers of goods also do, uh, do their business through e-commerce platform. Uh, E-commerce operators have been uh, held more responsible now for various uh, uh, various things like they will be uh, liable for a penalty of 10,000 or the tax involved uh, in that particular turnover for the reasons listed in this slide. One is where an unregistered person is dealing on an e-commerce platform, then to that extent there will be a penalty. Therefore, the implication is that whoever is dealing on platform on an e-commerce platform, they would be required to take a registration except for persons who are exempted specifically, and any persons who are dealing in interstate supply of goods or services, which otherwise he is not eligible to undertake interstate supply of goods or services, even on that, there can be a penalty. And if in case the e-commerce operators do not furnish all the details, uh, including details of turnover of an exempted person on in GSTR 8, that is the return which has to be filed by e-commerce operator, even that uh, uh, that uh, violation will attract the penalty. Uh, there is one category, specific category of uh, service called online information and database access or retrieval service. We call we call that OIDA. Uh, these services again, there are some changes to broaden broad base the taxability. The first change is where it says that the definition erstwhile definition had uh, uh, or the or the previously proposed definition had a specific clause that. Oida services have to be essentially automated and involving minimal human intervention. But however, this clause has been removed now and therefore any services which are provided uh, under this category would be subject to tax. So uh, to one example that we can talk about here is training. So there could be two varieties of training. One is a virtual or live training and the other is a recorded training. Recorded training was clearly covering, uh, getting covered under the uh, erstwhile definition, which which fits into the category essentially automated and involving minimal human intervention. Uh, but post this amendment, proposed amendment, after it, it, it gets notified, even virtual trainings, which, uh, which do not fit into this category, would be subject to tax. So basically, any service provider who is outside India and providing services to any customer in India who is not registered will be subject to uh, GST under this category henceforth. Second amendment in relation to the order is, uh, you know, again, this is also broad basing. So earlier, uh, there was some ambiguity on whether this service will be taxable uh, if it is not in relation to business or commerce. Uh, so the clause has been removed from the definition and therefore any unregistered person receiving services from an unregistered person uh, under this category would be subject to tax. On registration, this is one good change. Uh, there were situations where uh, uh, some specific categories of players were not were into non-taxable business completely. A classic example is education, any school, for example. They are not taxable under GST, but however, if they are falling or receiving any services uh, which are subject to tax, like for example, RCM, where they're receiving goods transport agency services or they're receiving legal services, only, to the, only for that purpose, they had to obtain GST registration and, and undertake various compliances. So the, now the propose, proposal is uh, to exempt even such categories of, uh, uh, of players where they say that if you're into totally non-taxable, you don't have to take registration in spite of undertaking such transactions. Uh, for example, you're importing services or you're doing RC, domestic RCM, you have certain transactions, etc. So this is one good change. Uh, of course, the government will have, you know, some exceptions where they can prescribe certain other class of persons or some class of persons where this exemption will still not, this uh, exception will still not apply. Uh, on filing of returns, now there's a time limit which has been prescribed. So all the GSTR 1, 3B, 9, 9C, 8, all these returns will not be allowed to be filed after three years from the due date. Uh, again, the government has the powers uh, to allow any specific category of persons to do so with specific permissions. On refund, uh, this is a little tricky now. The, the law prescribes that if you don't get the re refund within the prescribed time limit, then refund will be uh, provided to the taxpayers. But however, now this proposal uh, says that 
any refund will be subject to certain manners and conditions which will be prescribed. That means there could be a notification which will provide various situations from which date to which date it has to be calculated, etc. Uh, and uh, that could open up the Pandora's box again, and there could be some litigation on this front. The next, uh, okay, we move on to the customs. Uh, customs uh, primarily one uh, uh, exam one uh, change is in relation to exemptions. So all the exemptions primarily under Section 25, uh, it is uh, the default time limit for providing these exemptions uh, was two years after 31st day of the March, uh, falling from when exemption has been granted. Uh, so there was a, therefore there was a sunset clause, but now they have introduced certain exceptions where this two years time limit will not apply. For example, this bilateral agreements, multilateral agreements, any specific contracts with the uh, United Nations organizations, any state schemes, central government schemes, etc. There could be various uh, categories uh, for which this two years time limit will not apply. Settlement of cases, again, in customs, there is a process to settle cases where, uh, you know, uh, the taxpayers feel that they have a weak case, they can go to settlement commission and, uh, and submit various documents and pay the tax in interest. Uh, there was no time limit mentioned in the law earlier to conclude the settlement proceedings. Now this time limit is being prescribed to nine months from the date, last date of the month in which this application has been filed. And if, if that order is not passed, then the adjudicating authority can follow his normal course and uh, undertake the assessment. Uh, there are certain changes in relation to uh, anti-dumping safeguard duties and countervailing duties. Again, these are more uh, procedural, uh, where, where it, is, it is said that any determination or review of these duties has to be in the manner which has been prescribed by the rules. And any, any of such order or any of such determination and review document will be equivalent to an order as far as uh, appeal is concerned. So these documents can be considered as enough documents to file an appeal and there is no requirement to have an order in place to file an appeal. There are certain rate changes. Uh, we could uh, obviously be, be summarized, uh, basically major changes in this. Uh, the, there are changes in relation to customs tariff first scheduled to the customs tariff only to introduce new tariffs and modify tariffs, uh, uh, existing tariffs uh, based on various changes. And uh, general explanatory notes also have been amended to align to all the tariff changes. Uh, there, are, there was a review of all custom duty concessions and exemptions. It has been decided uh, uh, that about three or four years back by this government that every year they will review the custom duty exemptions and notifications because historically there have been many and uh, some of them may be redundant and some of them may not be required given the current economic scenario. And now they are uh, doing this process and therefore a lot of exemptions have been withdrawn. Some of the exemptions are extended. So as far as extensions are concerned, there are certain exemptions which are extended up to 31st March 2024. Uh, for example, gold, batteries for electrically operated vehicles, parts of aircraft, etc. And there are certain exemptions which are extended, be, uh, extended for a period of two years. For example, life-saving drugs and medicines and diagnostic kits and bulk drugs used for such life-saving drugs and medicines. And uh, there are certain other changes. Uh, one is increase in custom duty rate. Basically, silver has gone through a change where there's an increase in the rate and decrease in basic custom duty rate on parts of open cells for TV panels, uh, seeds used in manufacture of lab-grown diamonds, uh, social welfare charge exemptions are provided to silver, gold, and aer aeroplanes and parts of uh, and other aircrafts. Uh, there is a reduction in AIDC rate for coal, peat, and lignite. This could have a larger impact on the industry which is a beneficial move. Uh, currently, the C there is, there is uh, some amount of litigation pending uh, in relation to central sales tax law. Uh, now the SISTAT has been provided. Uh, SISTAT is, is the authority to settle the legal disputes under the CST law. So whatever advanced rulings which are pending before the advanced ruling authority will also be moving to SISTAT for resolving the cases. NCCD national calamity contingent duty has been increased on cigarettes and uh, the excise duty on CNG, uh, which is, uh, there is an exemption to the extent of GST, which has been paid on biogas or compressed biogas used in such manufacture of uh, blended uh, CNG. So that's uh, another uh, welcome change. 
So these are the changes in relation to indirect taxes. And uh, I, am, I conclude with this and we are happy to take up any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Pradeep and uh, Ms. Rajita for the very comprehensive uh, uh, details of the uh, budget announcements for all the direct taxes and indirect taxes. I think we have five questions. I'll read out uh, the questions in case. Uh... Yeah, I'll read out uh, the, uh, the questions relating to direct taxes. Okay, sure. Okay, so there's this question on, uh, can we take uh, uh, AT, double D and ATU uh, under the new tax regime? Answer is no. Uh, you cannot take uh, any deduction. Um, will the slides be shared? Yes, the slides will be shared. Uh, can you please, uh, the overall implications of market link dehensures amendment. Uh, as I told that uh, these are uh, the uh, when I'm saying about market linked debentures, they are listed debentures. They are, they are uh, the underlying asset is uh, a debenture as far as a loan or as a debt, but the returns are structured in such a way that the returns are linked to the market. So uh, it it. Uh, it, for, it takes a character of a quasi kind of an equity uh, where, uh, you know, the returns are uh, subjected to uh, the market forces, not like a specified or a fixed rate of interest on debentures or any debt. As, I, as we normally understand, a debt is where we get a fixed rate of return. But these instruments are structured in such a way that the returns are market linked. Something say like Nifty 50. Okay, so what happens is that, you know, uh, earlier they were treated as equity and they were getting taxed as long term at 10%. Okay, subject to your one lakh or whatever uh, is available. So that has been plucked to say that any market linked debenture is treated as a, a debt or a debenture for that. And it is the gains or tax as short-term capital gains taxed at 30%. Uh, I hope that has answered, but if you still have any questions, uh, we, can, we can take it up. Okay, uh, I understand that if any expense payable to MSME on 31st match is not paid within the given time limits, such expense deduction can be claimed only uh, in the financial year subject to its payment in the next financial year. Okay, uh, the point is very simple. Uh, under 43B, where there is a payment made uh, made to MSME, it is only deductible on, on actual payment basis. That is the rule number one. Now, let us look at the rule number two. The rule number two says that if it is on accrual basis, then it the MSME Act Section 15 comes into play to say that it has to be paid within 15 days if there is no agreement with that MSME or within 45 days, up to 45 days, if there is a specified agreement. So to answer your question, if, there, if I make a provision on 31st March, my answer is that it is allowable provided you make the payment within 15 days where there is no agreement or 45 days as the case may be. I hope I hope I have made it very clear. First rule on actual payment basis. The second rule is if you are uh, if you are accounted on accrual basis, obviously corporates have to follow accrual basis of accounting. Then all these provisions that you make on 31st March will be subjected to 15 days or 45 days as the case. Um, I think this is something to do with the. Uh, uh, it can be switch on to the new to old regime under uh, IT. Yes, you can. You can uh, switch on. Uh, there are there are uh, there are restrictions on that. Uh, what are the implications of uh, uh, ratchet structures and AF uh, uh, structures uh, due to angel tax uh, amendments? Uh, so, 
see we uh, let let me let me tell you that uh, uh, we will take up this this question a little later because uh, AAFs and the ratchet structures are quite quite uh, different. Um, do educational okay? These are this is uh, yeah. So on this on this query on do educational institutions who are exempted under GST liability needs to take registration uh, for GST liability under RCM. So now it will they will not be required to be take taken uh, because of the new proposed amendment. Uh, once this is uh, implemented, there is no requirement to take any registration. Hope that addresses the query. Can move to the next. Yeah. Um, business trust. On uh, the business trust, as I told you, business trust, cooperative societies, and and I mean the trust essentially have not been covered. We'll take it up subsequently. Uh, even if you pay STT on MLD, yes, it will be treated uh, as a short term capital gain from the market linked debentures. It will be treated as uh, uh, because this is a specific uh, uh, treatment given by the amendment. So uh, whether STT paid or not, if it is having the character of market link debenture, then it will it will be taxed as short term capital gains at thirty percent. What is the definition of a startup for these dollars? Is it only those post two thousand fourteen? So startup is a is a uh, the, 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 uh, the features of startup and all have been already there. So you need to register an entity as a startup with the with the DIPP, and uh, you need to give them. You will be getting a deduction of three uh, up to three years within the period of ten years. TCS on LRS payment to education is not there. Does this apply to hostel fees and boarding fees as well? Uh, it will apply to hostel fees and boarding uh, fees as well because uh, uh, the larger one has to look at the larger uh, uh, you know uh, point here, which is which is education. Okay, uh, such. Okay, uh, this is on GST. I am, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, uh, you have rented space. That means you own some space and you've rented space for certain shops, and you're charging GST. And this currently, the amount that you're collecting on rent is less than the basic exemption limit or the threshold for taxability under GST. Whether you are required to take registration, so the answer is no. You would not be required to take registration if it is below the threshold. Yeah, the next question is uh, we are paying advocate fee but not registered under GST because of we are running school. Is it RCM applicable? If yes, do we have to pay? So, uh, like I said before, this proposed amendment, you would be required to take registration. But now, with the proposed amendment, you will not be required to be uh, uh, taking registration. Uh, the next question is in relation to payment of tax on export of goods or services can be refunded completely or any restriction. Please explain. So this, uh, Mr. Ravi, this this depends on uh, multiple conditions, which sector you are into, whether you are in EOU, STPI, uh, etc. Uh, there are certain exceptions where you cannot pay tax on export of goods and services and claim refund. If uh, you are not falling under any of those restrictions, you can do that. But if you're falling under any such categories, then uh, you cannot pay tax on exports and claim a rebate. We call it rebate or refund uh, in, in that situation. Will there be any amendment under RCM provisions if educational institution do not need to take registration? Do service provide will pay GST under forward charge? We will have to wait clarity on that, on how and who will pay the GST on that. Uh, as of now, they said registration will not be required to be taken. Whether the liability will be discharged by the service provider or service recipient, that, that question still needs to be addressed by the government. 
uh, the last one I can see is service or manufacturing, last second service or manufacturing. Uh, sorry, this is in relation to export of goods, tax on export of goods. So for both services and manufacturing, there could be certain restrictions uh, depending upon what kind of structure you're operating. For example, in manufacturing, if you're using advance authorization, then you cannot take or uh, you cannot pay tax and claim refund of that. And if you're in service and if you're using or if you're an STPI scheme, then you cannot claim uh, taxes paid as refund. The next question is we are having trust and on that we are running two schools. We have not registered with GST. Now for what are the payments RCM will apply? So is the uh, if I understand the question is on what kind of payments RCM will be applicable? Uh, there is a list of uh, uh, services on which RCM is applicable, like, for example, legal services, transportation, uh, uh, you know, uh, and directors, independent directors, etc. Uh, we can share that list with, with you separately. I think uh, we have come to the conclusion of the question and answer. And uh, uh, I request all the members, if they have any more questions, kindly write directly to the expert speakers at BDO. Uh, we'll share the PPTs and uh, in that you, you have the contacts. Or we will definitely share the uh, PPTs from our end with the contact details of both the speakers. You can write to IACC or um, uh, Thai Hyderabad or WT World Trade Center Shamshabad and uh, we can pass on the questions to the speakers. So either ways you can ask your questions. And now we have come to the conclusion of the session. I really thank uh, Mr. Pradeep uh, Kastla, uh, partner and uh, 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 tax and Regulatory Services, BDO India LLB, and Ms. Rajita Boru, uh, Partner, Indirect Texas, uh, Regulatory Services, BDO India LLB. Uh, we really thank you, both of you, uh, for such a comprehensive presentation, so much explanation about each point, and answering all the queries of all the members. Uh, thank you so much for the session. Uh, I also thank uh, Ms. Rashida Adinwala, uh, President Thai Hyderabad, uh, for her time and joining us today, for your inputs and gracious presence, madam. I also thank uh, Mr. K. Ganesh Subudhi, Chairman IACC, for joining us today and uh, for your input, sir. And I not uh, la la last but not the least, all our members of all the three associations, we thank you for your participation and uh, look forward to uh, organizing more programs for your benefit. Thank you one and all. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll conclude the session here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a nice Bye. day. Bye.